Thank you all for joining us uh, to listen to this first lecture in our new series from, the, from Sydney University with the Power Institute supported by the Art Gallery of New South Wales and VisAsia. It's great to see people joining us for this new series of lectures on art and, na art and nature. Very appropriate at this time. So my name's Anne Proctor and I represent VisAsia, which is very happy and delighted to collaborate again with the University of Sydney and um, other and the Power Institute to put on this ex this series of lectures, uh, which should be very exciting. And uh, I just mention a little bit about VisAsia. It's a philanthropic entity within the Art Gallery of New South Wales that supports education, exhibitions and uh, academic programs to do with Asian art. And um, if you would like to know more about VisAsia, you could check out our website. But now um, I'm very pleased to be able to hand over to Olivia Krischer, who will introduce tonight's eminent speaker, Professor Patrick Flores from Manila in the Philippines. Thank you, Olivier. Yeah. Thank you, Anne. Um, that's fantastic. And I'd like to welcome everyone here as convener of the Sydney Asian Art Series. My name is Olivier Krischer. Um, the theme this, of this year's series is Art and Environment, and we're delighted uh, to have Patrick here to inaugurate the series. Before I introduce Patrick, who I'm sure many of you are already uh, familiar with through his work uh, and his, uh, both his research work and curatorial work, it's my privilege to first acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation on whose land I am speaking uh, to you from today, unceded land. I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and also to extend this respect and acknowledgement to First Nations peoples everywhere. Um, this year marks the fifth iteration, the fifth year of the Sydney Asian Art Series, which is fantastic. Uh, it was uh, formed in 2017, as you've just heard from Anne, as a collaboration between the Power Institute, China Studies Centre here at the University, uh, as well as VisAsia and the Art Gallery of New South Wales. So a big thank you to this partnership. Um, but I'd also like to acknowledge our audience, uh, especially those who have joined us uh, as the series moved online under the pandemic in 2020, as many of our lives did. Um, I think without your engagement as an audience, this, um, the series wouldn't have come this far and it certainly wouldn't be a, a vital platform to share uh, the sort of research that we'll be hearing from tonight, which is uh, really leading research on timely issues to do with Asian art from around the world. So the theme this year of art and environment originally crystallised during the Australian bushfires in late 2019. Um, but obviously it's taken on a different balance or currency under the ongoing pandemic. In the series, we're interested to ask questions such as how have creative practices represented, interpreted and shaped natural environments and their elements? What does it mean to think of this region as a network, for example, of intimate eco-political flows? What can we learn from art, uh, from an art history of oceans rather than nations, for example? which I think is something very relevant to tonight's conversation in terms of its water crossing dimensions. Um, and what alternative spaces, for example, what new myths or futures do art cultures and their histories make thinkable or memorable in the face of ecological crises? We have a fantastic lineup of speakers this year reflecting on various contexts um, throughout the year. Uh, but tonight, as I said, we're welcoming Patrick Flores, who joins us um, from what is afternoon in Manila. And I think some of our audience is also joining us from Manila. So a particular welcome um, to them. Patrick wears many, many hats, only some of which I'll be able to describe and, and introduce here. He is uh, known to many of us as a professor of art history at the University of Philippines. He's also a curator at the Vargas Museum uh, and director of the Philippine Contemporary Art Network. Um, that already uh, sounds pretty busy to me, but uh, he's a prolific writer. His publications include Painting History, Revisions in Philippine Colonial Art, Remarkable Collection, Art, History and the National Museum, Past Peripheral, Curation in Southeast Asia, uh, and more recently, Art After War, 
1948 to 1969, but he's also co-edited with Joan Keane, a special issue of third text on Southeast Asian art, uh, among many other publications, chapters, papers, um, etc. Um, as you could probably tell, there's a strong historical foundation to his work, but he's incredibly busy as a curator as well and highly productive in that area. To name just a few large scale projects, which I think have been taking up a lot of his time of late. Um, he was part of the transnational exhibition under construction, New Dimensions in Asian Art um, across 2000 and curated position papers for the 2008 Guangzhou Biennale. Um, in 2015, he was also curator of the Philippine Pavilion at the Venice Biennale, which marked its return to um, the Biennale after uh, many, many years, over 50 years. Um, more recently, in 2019, he was artistic director of the Singapore Biennale, um, and next year he, will, he is curating the Taiwan Pavilion uh, in Venice. So we're extremely fortunate to welcome him and have some of his valuable time this evening. Uh, to share this first lecture. Amazingly, he also has time and, and headspace for smaller intimate projects, uh, curatorial projects, including one of which he'll be talking about uh, next week at exactly this time, if you can join us. Um, he'll be talking about um, an exhibition or rather he'll be in conversation with artists from an exhibition that he's curating in Bangkok opening soon. And, and that they are Papatuan Swanakut, who's based here in Sydney, uh, as well as Samak Kosem joining us from Chiang Mai. Uh, so if you can join us at this time next week, look for the details on the Power Institute website to sign up for that as well. Um, finally, some housekeeping just before we get underway. Um, most of you will probably be familiar by now with the Zoom environment. Um, there you should find that there's a Q&A function where you can post questions. Uh, by all means, you can vote up questions uh, there. Um, and after Patrick's talk, I'll be moderating a discussion with him. Um, so I encourage you to place your questions there throughout the talk so that we can gather them all. I'm sure there'll be many. So without further ado, uh, I will hand over to Patrick to introduce his topic. I believe the artist is joining us this evening. So I'd also lastly like to um, give a special uh, welcome to Jinyi. Thank you very much for joining us. Patrick, over to you. Thank you, Olivier, for that generous uh, introduction and thank you and for the uh, warm welcome. Uh, I'm honored to be uh, the first presenter for this series on art and environment. Uh, I just would like to say at the outset that the uh, work that I'm presenting uh, today is a work in progress. So uh, uh, what I can walk you through uh, are the framework of this project and also some reflections on uh, methodology. Um, I also would focus on a particular aspect of the practice of Juni, which is uh, installation. Uh, he is an artist of broad sympathies. Uh, he does other stuff, but uh, this afternoon I'm focusing on the installative uh, corpus. And like Olivier, just a shout out, shout out to, to, uh, to Juni, who is in the room. Uh, uh, with his wife, uh, Tess. So uh, I'd like to share my, my slides now. So this talk comes, comes out of a current uh, monographic project on the Philippine artist, Jun Yi, who was born Luis Enano Yi Jr. Such a task is not as straightforward as it might appear. While there are efforts to reconsider the monographic gesture of privileging the artistic agency as the central intelligence of art. On the one hand, there is as well a reinvestment in the same agency of the artist as the exemplary medium to transpose whatever context is imagined to surround it on the other. The invitation of the Sydney Asian Art Series to present for the program on art and environment has led me to think about the ways to write such a monograph concerning the artist, but within the problematic of environment and by extension within the trope of uh, ecology. In his recent book titled The Asian Modern, the art historian John Clark annotates the modernities of Asian art through practices of artists. When asked why he would cast the artist as the exemplary vehicle of history, he argues that it is the artist 
who mediates the climate of certain conditions and that those conditions, as I interpret Clark, are then reworked to anticipate a mode of production that stems from the creative talent of mediation. In the context of this reciprocal action, the artist is viewed not as a virtuoso, but a bricoleur or forager who refunctions exigent and contingent technology and proposes inventive forms out of fragments. Instead of emerging from a social context, the artist instead inhabits an ecology of relations, one among the myriad species and materials. It is from this angle that I view my work on, on Jun Yu, who is made to dwell in the mangroves of the environment and therefore in the intertide of the creative project. The art history that is hewn from this ecology speaks to Juni's imbrication in the environment as an aesthetic form, but also as a historical condition, the person who partly make, makes things happen. Here, the art history that I try to conceive converses with the notion of the environment in the historiography of the French Annal School in the beginning of the 20th century in which environmental history would be nothing less than the nature of the making. As the historian Emmanuel Leroy Laduri puts it, the Annal has been interested in the problem of an ecological history that concerns both the paroxysms of contagious diseases and weather fluctuations, end of quote. We can layer over this environmental history an ecological or animate art history in which the geopoetic mingles with the sensible person and thing. I also approach an attentive reading of Juni by offering a vernacular vocabulary in the form of pun, which that brings together the notion of a stem and therefore of origin and originator. The genealogy is Austronesian, from which Tagalog, the basis of Filipino as a national language, elaborates. The word puno in Filipino means tree, and it also means leader. This is not to quickly valorize Juni as avant-garde. It is only to acknowledge his pioneering role in paving a path for an installative ethos and aesthetic to gain ground in the Philippines one that is committed to honoring natural form and its transformations in ever-changing, oftentimes humbling social atmospheres. I begin with shop house, inter-province, inter-island. Walking through this monographic project, I begin with the shop house and the inter-province, inter-island as the place of creative formation. Juni was born in 1942 in Agusan del Norte in Mindanao in the Southern Philippines, many times or spaces removed from the capital of Manila. His mother was a housewife who did embroidery. His father, who was born in China, was a merchant, baker, tailor, and poet who knew martial arts and did carpentry and magic, among other interests. Juni responded to the composition of objects quite early. These objects were linked up with everyday life and the cycle of social events like feasts or observances in a Catholic town or occasions in school. He drew motifs on paper plates, designed floats and sets, cobbled together his own toys, slingshots and walking stilts. As the artist Jose Tense Ruiz writes, Juni would gather drippings from candles of the cemetery, ball this together, then carve Christ's head with his fingernails and pocket knife. His father's shop house as a space of motley goods might have introduced him to the range of textures that things could assume, an initiation into appearances and then to the techniques of their fabrication. The general store had a bakery, a hardware, a haberdashery, a stall for frozen flavored liquid, wartime surplus, and an array of miscellany. It furnished him a supply of pencils, paper, and crayons. When bulks of paper material needed for wrapping bread in the bakery were unpacked, he would marvel at the copious graphic cord, 
which included magazines and the comics. This enhances fascination with popular print culture, specifically the comics forms from the United States with titles like Prince Valiant and from companies such as Marvel and DC and those from homegrown exemplars such as Francisco Cochin. He remembers experimenting with cigarette foil onto which he would rub an image to transfer it onto the side lined with wax. He also collected in glass jars river stones that mysteriously rolled along the floor of the house, honing his affinity with the natural, the supernatural, and the human act of gathering. While he grew up in the center of town in Kabadbaran, his mother's family had a sprawling property in Nabago in the neighboring province of Surigao. It had a rice field, a rice farm, sorry, and was linked to a river and mangrove that led to the sea. Juni's formal and more institutional initiation into art came by way of his studies in Cebu, another city and another island, where he pursued his interests in drawing and representation. Juni also worked in Surigao, another city in Mindanao, at the hotel reception. And when he went back to Cebu for college, he assumed many roles in a funeral parlor, from a janitor to a mortician and on to an embalmer. Sculpture. It was when he was granted a scholarship for studies at the University of the Philippines in Diliman that Juni would be immersed in fine arts training with its attendant pedagogy and stylistic obsessions. He decided to major in sculpture and was mentored by the foremost modernist Philippine sculptor of the time, Napoleon Abueva. His apprenticeship with Abueva was critical in refining a vocabulary in modernist sculpture and his relationship with wood as a material. Abueva's modernism emerged from the Fine Arts Academy, but it was also playful and was keen on the pragmatic aspects of sculpture, as we can see here with Abueva at the Cranbrook Art Academy uh, floating his baby Moses and in the pool of the school, an exhibition in Kansas and a, a competition as well in Kansas on your far left. Abueva was an artist of broad sympathies and he was inclined to read the sculptural as functional. According to Abueva, and I quote him, I work on um, functional, I work on functional objects on the basis of sculptural problems rather than utilitarian objectives as diversions from pure sculpture. So this is Abueva in Venice, the first time that the Philippines participated in 1964. He went there together with Jose Hoya, the abstract expressionist to represent the country. I am intrigued uh, by the interplay of categories that Abueva redistributes, the functional object, the sculptural problem, the utilitarian objective, and the pure sculpture. These are his uh, pieces for a playground. Abueva mingles them to produce modern sculpture, and this is probably how Juni, the apt pupil, contemplates the matter of sculpture as functional but not utilitarian. It is a problem and not an objective and surely nowhere near pure because it is a diversion if we follow the logic of Abueva. In fact, the critic Unidas Benesa takes note of Abueva's corpus that is marked by, in his words, incredible variety to include, and I quote, Christ's, Madonna's, nude scarabows, wild boars, horses, armadillos, one-man seesaws, coffin-style benches, lounges, lamps, screens, doors, fountains, chariots, friezes, facades, arches, waterborne objects, airborne objects, busts, reliefs, shrines, memorials, playthings, playhouses, doghouses, abstractions, constructions, and other objects and things yet to be identified. The critic Alice Guillermo comments that in Abueva's work, the functional concept blends with fantasy, as in the chastity beds with their intriguing apertures, partitions, and padlocks. 
Abueba studied at the Cranbrook Academy in Michigan and the experimental and interdisciplinary orientation of the school and the formation of a Michigan modern in design, art, and architecture may have shaped his attitudes towards what may well be an alacritous modernism. Juni's early sculpture like the last mile of Ho Chi Minh proceeded from this exploration of the Western style as taught at the university and his apprenticeship in Abueva's studio. Like the piece of adobe, he turned into a Henry Moore form, which won in a competition. In 1967, he left his mentor's fold to strike out on his own. In 1974, his sculpture in the woods or our wood was awarded grand prize of the Art Association of the Philippines competition, exemplifying his translation of natural form into sculpture inspired by Mount Makiling in Los Baños, a town in the province of Laguna, south of the capital of Manila. The work consisted of 20 pieces of hardwood called malabayabas, or guava-like, and evoked the pattern of the branches of trees. The term malabayabas form for a timber tree endemic to the Philippines is quite um, uh, mysterious. It references the guava, but it looks very different from it. Anyway, I am drawn to the misrecognition. Juni first visited Los Baños in 1971 and decided to live there in 1974. In 1985, he founded Sining Makiling, one of the earliest, if not the first, galleries of the University of the Philippines. Los Baños as a site conveys its own agency, being home to the fabled Mount Makiling, a mystical mountain. The University of the Philippines campus, which specializes in agriculture and ecology, and the Philippine High School for the Arts, a high school for uh, exemplary uh, students uh, established by Imelda and the facility and the uh, exceptional facility of Cold War development, the International Rice Research Institute that in the 70s yielded the miracle rice as a response to global hunger. On this role in the war against famine, a scholar points to the developmental aesthetic rooted in nature it took diffuse processes, according to him, unfolding over decades, the spread of irrigation and market arrangements, new political relations between farmers and the state, and the rise and fall of developmental regimes, and illustrated them in a parable of seeds, end of quote. And we see here the visit of Lyndon B. Johnson to Los Baños at the, at the Institute. Uh, hosted, of course, by the new president, Ferdinand Marcos, with the first lady, Imelda Marcos, and uh, the founding director of the Institute, Robert Chandler. Juni aspired to not merely affirm the promise of modernist sculpture, regardless how reflexive the art was. He rather sought ways to overcome not only the orthodoxy of the tradition, but the very nature of the material itself, that sustains an aspect of the tradition in the sculptural and the modern. This inspired him in a way to reclaim wood from the modernist appropriation and retrace its source and spirit, its puno, in the forest. This restitutive desire demanded from Juni a different conception of space for the work to play out, as well as another ethos of making and relating with the people who are mod motivated to pass through and imbibe the space. When nature becomes the material, the agency of nature participates in the materialization of whatever form is intuited by the artist. And so while Juni's sculptural work bears traces of Abueva's approach towards material and form, it tends to elicit practical relationships with whatever or whomever encounters it. The work in uh, Taman Surup Surupati Soropati in Jakarta, titled Rebirth for the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, is an instructive instance in which the sculptural work becomes easily hospitable. In scanning the formal world of Juni, we can constellate it with other experiments in sculpture, like those of, let us say, Lamberto Hechanova, Francisco Verano, 
and David Medallion. There is no straight line, of course, between Juni and Hechanova, Verano, and Medallion. But their conversations around Philippine sculpture expand the latter's latitude and, takes us, and take us to the intransitional phase of modernism as signaled by the emergence of assemblage through Echanova and Verano and kinetic sculpture via, via Medallia. Alongside this visual artist, the efforts of the architect Francisco Maniosa, who was a pioneer in vernacular architecture and we see here the banana house, the affordable housing project in 81, everything made of banana. This was uh, not built. And the Tadlac housing project near Los Baños, which, uh, uh, was, uh, which consisted of uh, coconut and bamboo materials, uh, another project of Maniosa. So the work of the architect Maniosa and the muse, uh, this is another low cost socialized housing by Maniosa using native indigenous materials in Tolosa, the hometown of the first lady Imelda Marcos. Um, so alongside this, alongside the work of Maniosa and also music maker, music maker and ethnomusicologist Jose Maceda might prove germane as well within the wider exchange between indigenous material and modernist translation, the avant-garde and national identity. So we see the early works of Jose Maceda who uh, always uh, uh, cited or integrated uh, indigenous musical instruments in his productions, in his production of new musical forms. We can see in Pagsamba, which was held at the UP in the Catholic Church, Ugma Ugma, which was held uh, in uh, first in UCLA, next in uh, Manila, and then the last one in Bahia in Brazil, and uh, Cassettes 100 in 1971 at the Cultural Center of the Philippines, Udlut Udlut at the University of the Philippines. You see all these indigenous materials are playing out in the music. And I'd like to thank the Center for Ethnomusicology of, of the UP for these images. So fundamental in Juni's practice is the meshing of craft and ecology. In his own words, and I quote Juni, taking the lead from insects and birds, I started making simple objects with, with my bare hands and slowly progressed to stone as cutting tools, stick for digging, and other crude implements to make work easier. Then I used man-made tools like knife and bolo, my need for more art materials also increased and always the mountain supplied me with enough materials. Only much later did I realize that the art materials I took for granted now were slowly but steadily revealed to me by the mountain. I was not a researcher discovering, but an apprentice learning from the mountain, which reveals and patiently guides me along the path of indigenous art making." End of quote. Vine, Balag, Gayak. In this phase of the work of Juni, the impulse to be convivial, to gather people in a common space alternated with the impulse to offer commentary on the current situation. The sociality therefore dilates in this instance as it is acutely inflected by the trope of the vine, which reaches out as a profuse extension beyond an existing order. In the work Balag, 1970, which uh, has no documentation at all, unfortunately. Juni constructed in a vacant lot in the University of the Philippines campus in Diliman, a human-sized trellis from bamboo strips lashed to place by strings. To this organic scaffold, he invited passersby to attach objects and expressions in writing pertaining to love or protest. The structure opened as an event with live music, the reading of poetry, and feasting. A close cognate in Philippine folk, tour, folk culture in terms of ethos and technology is the annual Maytime festivity called Pahiyas in, uh, in the Quezon province, in which households in certain towns in Quezon province adorn the facades of their homes, of the fam of families' produce, or whatever they find expressive. At day's end, the community collectively partakes of the bounty that has entrusted the architecture. 
the vine that creeps across the framework in Junyi's work is a supplement made possible by the participation of a public and a potential community to fulfill the possibility of a domos that can be a demos. As it is a supplement, so is it an ornament that intricately enlivens the structure. Eight years later, Juni would dutifully gather materials from the forest and the mountain, put them in glass jars and give them away as gifts. Perhaps as a way to fulfill the promise of the vine, the work titled Gayap began in 1980, which means to adorn, elaborated on the anticipation of the vine, of the ornament. He describes the things of Gayak as gawang gubat, roughly translated as both work of the forest and made from the forest. Guava-like malabayabas. Juni prepares the ground for the public in Balag, introducing into the design that improvised space a level of liveliness, making, a, making it at once a social artifice and a natural collective. This necessity of the public to activate a heightened sense of the environment resurfaces in 1976 in the work Malabayabas at Iba Pangkahoy sa Eskultura ni Junyi, Guava Light, and other kinds of wood in the sculpture of Junyi. It was set up at the National Park in Manila called Luneta. It is a site for nation state commemorations, uh, ceremonies to commemorate national holidays and inaugurate presidents. Junyi constructs wooden structures to confine an object or a body, like a prison cell, as signaled by the grid. The hardwood used looked hefty and present, like square frames or modules stacked up, one on top of the other. Like the grid in Balag, the structure here is box-like, meant to contain. Beside them, Juni performed the acts of half-seeing, half-speaking, half-hearing, all of which reference constriction of both nature and human sensing and faculty. In a performative photograph, Juni presents these structures in graduated scales, the lowest one housing a plant and the rest housing himself, but increasingly enclosing him. He consigns all pieces of his clothing to the last, to the tallest structure and turns his back on the viewer, starkly naked. Wood things. An aspect of the constriction may well be the museum and its exemplary space of the white cube. It gets more politically complicated when this museum is part of a cultural center founded by a government that has put the country under martial rule. At the cultural center of the Philippines, Juni exhibited wood things, a watershed work that would offer his corpus an iterative visual language, mainly consisting of ambiguous life forms akin to caterpillars with hair rise, racing bristles, mutating from splinters of plants, and like the earlier vine, would crawl across the premises of the gallery. In 1980, the artist curator Raimundo Albano asked Juni to exhibit this work at the small gallery of the Cultural Center of the Philippines. Juni would largely fill the room with around 500 scrambling forms made from folded banana stems held together by banana stalks. Within these creaturely wood things are dried kapok pods, which mimic spikes or appendages to suggest liveliness and a procession. These forms encroach on the floor and the walls like an army or colony of insects or larvae infects, infesting a host. The gallery is suffused with tones of blue, red, and straw emanating from lamps and emitting the scent of tropical organic substance enhanced by acacia pods strewn on the floor. For Albano, Juni's index of the environment translates as exhibitionary praxis a total perception of one's of one pure situation, according to Albano. In this formulation, the binary between the environmental and the installative dissipates in the face of the situated and the situational. That being said, Albano locates attention between the source of the form and the locus of display, speaking of, uh, quote him, a brought-in quality strange, obtrusive, alien, a charming presence." End of quote. This rough edge that is the point of contact 
is situated within Albano's concept of developmental art, in which art as a developing proposition seeks to confuse rubrics and tenets. And Juni does this by holding out, I quote Albano again, unexpected rules and unexpected materials, and inevitably prompting us to ask questions like, and this is still Albano speaking, what is permanently in art? The object, what is sculpture? Or can sculpture borrow from theater, landscape architecture, and science? Would things as a visual schema would iterate, uh, iterate in work such as, this is still, uh, sorry, uh, uh, would things, would iterate in Wood Song in 1982, Extinct Future in 1983, and Urban Autumn in 1985. It is important to note at this point, the interlocution of, of, the, of Albano, of Juni's work, specifically the theorization of installation. He wrote on wood things and would begin his annotation with this, and I quote, for its environmental intimacy, a sense of being an, in a natural world, somewhat akin to imagination and fancy, one relates with the works on different experiential levels. Albano later in the text alludes to how Juni's perception of the environment leads him to see things well in order, everything belonging to each other, balancing forces. He considers the artist's wood things as pets, informed by what he calls a botanical zoological paradox in which plants are made to look like animals. In 1982, Albano brought wood things to Paris for the Paris Biennale. Juni placed the work in a dark room lighted only by an incandescent bulb, making it, in his mind, more forbidding and less legible as artistic form in a wide view. And unfortunately, we cannot also find a documentation of that iteration of wood things in Paris, in Paris but we will keep looking. In 1981, Albano wrote his, water, his watershed essay, Installations, A Case for Hangings, in which he cites a work of Juni for the exhibition Art of the Regions, Baguio Los Baños, for creating an environment, quoting Albano, of structured branches, vines, and dry leaves, a work that shocks with truth and romanticism against established norms of good old sculpture. He further notes that the said work titled Autumn Machine, and I found a picture which was misrecognized by the curators of, uh, of Fukuoka as the seed of autumn. This is not seed of autumn. According to Juni, this is Autumn Machine. And this demonstrates a total visual installation, according to Albano. Dry leaves attached to the floor, dry branches hang from the ceiling and float in midair. Colored lights heighten strange illumination of the work. Shadows spread patterns throughout the room. Given the freedom to work on practically unconditioned space, an art idea becomes more meaningful. The fact that the sculptor no longer depends on gravity alone changes attitudes towards the concept of art itself. End of quote. For Albano, the installation surfaces as new sculpture, derives from childhood urges, and is closer to the Philippine sensibility than painting or sculpture. <clears throat> Juni relates that he first heard of the term installation from Albano, who in 1979 included him in an exhibition at the Cultural Center of the Philippines in which he contributed the work abortion, with Juni with the work. A large egg or nest-like form crafted from twigs to reference the womb of nature. In the same year, this is a better view of, uh, of abortion. In the same year, Albano curated the Philippine participation at the first Asian art show in Fukuoka. Juni offered the work Seed of Autumn. This is the Asian art show in Fukuoka, which was supposed to be hung which was supposed to be hung, and this is Seed of Autumn. This is Seed of Autumn, which was supposed to be hung, but the museum did not have the provisions, and so was laid out on the floor. This is Seed of Autumn. If you can see the cursor, this is Seed of Autumn. And I think this is Ray Albano. Yeah, this is Seed of Autumn from this one. This is Seed of Autumn. There is, 
Fukuoka cannot tank, so it was on the floor. Uh, <clears throat> and as a consequence, I think, of this display, um, preempted the installative potential of the piece, uh, prompting Albano to write a forthright essay on why the festival in Fukuoka turned out to be a, more a modernist enterprise than a contemporary event, but that's for another seminar, I think. And uh, uh, the uh, seed of autumn uh, resurfaces in the poster that Albano designed here, uh, here using it as the skirt of sorts of Juni. Um, had it been hung, it would have been the first, it would have been the first installative work in the Fukuoka series um, together with together with Philippine artists, Philippine artist Ilyana's, Ilyana Lee's contribution of crawling masking tapes. And this is, these are the crawling masking tapes here. So it seems that Filipino artists uh, were disposed to these crawling things, no? So either wood things or masking tape. Um, uh, together with the yeah, contribution of crawling masking tapes in the same exhibition. For Juni, creating installations as a way, was a way to turn against the dominance of the Western paradigm of art making and may have been sharpened alongside his prolonged exposure to nature, his nationalism and the, the hippie hype, the, the hippie hype, the, the hippie lifestyle uh, to which he responded. Juni's engagement with the cultural center of the Philippines extended till the 90s and onward. In uh, 1998, he laid out a uh, hundred flags to commemorate the centennial of Philippine independence, a tribute to the first modern democratic republic in Asia. He called it Isang Daan, which may mean 100 or one way. Um, this is another view of that um, insulation. And in 2007, with the country reeling from the whiplash of two ravaging typhoons, he set up Angun, collected remnants of trees felled through illegal logging threading through them an intriguing red rope as if to evoke a scene of uh, slavery. These two works may well complicate the realm of memory, the specter of the cultural center of the Philippines standing on reclaimed land, the ritual of the nation state as it revisits its origin in the 19th century, and the scene of uh, pillage and mourning of a planet in peril. The concept of things for Juni was a generous cipher for forms that may be appropriated and may also unhinge themselves from, from structure. In other words, they mark modes of alienation as well as repossession in the spirit of bricolage as intimated earlier. In Fukuoka in 1991, at the instance of the Fukuoka City Museum, Juni accumulated a myriad of disposed items from electronics to bicycles arranged as if in a fair or a market or a procession. Naming the work City Things, he would troll them as it were under wide fishing nets as a reference to the port city of Fukuoka as a cluster of, of more garbage sealed with black plastic bag seats, uh, seats on the ground or car tires under transparent umbrellas. Um, of the uh, images of the Fukuoka uh, exhibition and uh, the cover of the inaugural issue of Art and Asia Pacific was Juni's work uh, for Fukuoka. Climate. The various ways by which nature is instrumentalized by human needs has led Juni to reflect on the behavior of climate and the catastrophes that come with it. In 19 1998, uh, Juni returned to Japan, specifically to Oita, or Oita, on the southern island of Kyushu for a national bamboo festival. He built a structure made of bamboo set up like intertwined posts. Within this porous framework, he put up a gargantuan rain stick, 12 meters tall, which would rotate to create the sound of rain from plummeting pellets. Titled, If Rain You Are, I'll Bathe the Earth With You, the work spoke to the drought of his home island of Mindanao. 
Then we swore on the behavior of the climate had been prompted by iterative cataclysms in the country. In uh, 1989, he installed acid rain in Manila. And um, in 1991, he referenced the flood in Ormoc in Havana titled Ormoc, a province which had been devastated by a merciless storm. In the work for Havana, he set up a large net that caught leaves and below it was a grave-like formation. As it was about to be opened by Biennale officials, and this is quite an interesting detail, a band of residents stormed the area and ransacked the installation took what they wanted and burned the rest. It was in Havana where he, along with the uh, artist Virgilio Aviado, wrote a manifesto on indigenous art, which they imagine as a global art form and challenged the fact that, and they quote the manifesto, its sources, its sources of supply are on the verge of extinction. The final part is sight. Uh, finally, Juni's work with the environment is the work of sight. It is not only a matter of working in a site, it is a sensitive recognition of the very work of sight itself, the agency of the ecology and the human response to its forces. A foundational moment in Juni's practice was the exhibitions he organized, which he called Sight Works, in 1981 from a subsidy secured through the 13 Artists Grant. Juni organized a series of outdoor installations on the grounds of the University of the Philippines campus in, in Los Baños. Called Site Works, it involved artists such as Henara Banson, Lani Maestro, Arnel Agawin, Julie Delena, Federico Jose de Roy, Raimundo Albano, students at the Philippine High School for the Arts, among others. Site Works had its iterations in 1983 with works on site and the third one in 1984, uh, which was called Site Work 2, and this is Site Work 2, in which he, uh, he invited artists like Santiago Bose and Jose Legaspi to participate by bringing in materials from the outside to interact with the space. This is Site Work 2, but the third one. So there is a bit of a confusion in the, in the banner. I just clarified this with, uh, with Juni minutes ago. So Juni was aware, by, was aware of the tension between an exhibition and the natural milieu from which the material would, would come. In his essay, in his essay for the Philippine Art Supplement, this is Juni writing, he makes a mention of a brought in quality of works made to, plays out, to, to play out in an open space, works that he imagines as utilizing nature's raw materials as medium. He is perturbed by the possible discrepancy between forest and white cube within what he would portray as an object atmosphere relationship. That said, Juni would also generously reorient the situation in which the object, and I quote him, has achieved and acquired the quality of its source. I like that phrasing, has achieved and acquired the quality of its source. After all, Juni believes in the, and I quote him, encounter with nature, on a halfway ground between the mountain and the city. This is from uh, the essay, A Halfway Ground, Los Banos Site Works. And we can see a bit of documentation of those site works, works by Juni, works by Ray, Ray Albano and Henara Banson, work by Ginny Dandan, work by Lani Maestro, and also the participation, the work by Arnel Agawin and the participation of a theater group in, uh, in, in, in the university. The work of the site lends itself to a certain political possibility of critique, the evocation of memory and melancholy, and an invitation to collective ritual, which speaks to communion with the elements and the community of people. Juni's contribution to the first Asia Pacific Triennial in 1993 titled Breeding Ground would recall his city things commissioned by Fukuoka. He collected disposed items from the people in Brisbane and encased them in plastic bags to form a mound with dew-like transparent membranes of garbage. In 2009, the memorial in Rishon Lezion in Israel was completed at the National Holocaust Memorial Park. Juni explored the image of three doors of different heights opening inward to form a triangle. The reference is how 
The Philippines in the 30s received Jewish people fleeing Hitler's Germany. He carved the footprints of the refugees, a man and a woman on the floor, and those of a child on the door. The city is home to many Filipino migrant workers. More recent initiations include installations set up in the area of the Vargas Museum at the University of the Philippines, dissecting space with sound and silence, uh, curated by Tessa Guazon, is an invitation of Juni to the audience to pull the strings that he wove around the space beside the museum. Tethered through the strings are tin cans. For him, this evokes the traditional farming device to ward birds off the crops. But in an insulate, insulative situation, the visual details of white cloth, string, and feed can flat out the space. And the gesture of pulling the string and releasing the clanging metal recall the fertility of land and the flight of birds. In annotating the practice of Juni in the context of art and environment, I am led to think about in art historical terms, the relationship between sculpture and installation, the museum and the landscape, the inside and the outside. Uh, so I'm still struggling with these relationships. To a significant extent, Juni has offered an installative impulse um, to artists who have nurtured a kind, a kindred installative language within the matrix of a deep locality and an ethnic cosmology. And they have sought a visual grammar to create situations or to dialogue with an international idiom of insulation coming from other sources. Here we locate two schools, as it were, the Baguio School, represented by the works of Santiago Bose, and here we see uh, sketches of uh, Bose's installations, three installations for the Adelaide Festival in 1994 and the work of Roberto Villanueva uh, 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 called Labyrinth. So that's the first school, the Baguio School, and also the Makiling School, uh, evidence in the initiations of artist teachers in the art high school, which I showed earlier in Los Baños, like Roberto Fileo, whose primary material is sawdust, and Alfredo Isabel Aquilisan, who, who, who uh, oh, always, I mean, Freddie and Isabel always involved the participation of people to produce these uh, initiations. We are also tempted, we are also tempted to glance at Arte Povera, if that makes sense, as a coordinate of Juni, which may lead us to the interdisciplinary artist and cultural worker Brenda Fajardo's notion of the aesthetics of poverty. So I, try to complicate Arte Povera with aesthetics of poverty, a uh, rationale in designing for Philippine theater, which was, which was written in the 80s. Notion of the aesthetics of poverty in the 80s in her practice in, in theater. So we see here again, alongside uh, Maniosa, the architect, or uh, the musician, um, uh, Jose Maceda, the investment in local material like coconut or bamboo and so on and so forth. Moreover, I am drawn to revisit the concept of appropriation of nature as material and its aestheticization in art, partly through a distinct scenography. Corollary in this regard is the intersection between the natural and the cultural within the citation of the indigenous and the risk of its assimilation into the national, even as the natural may point to a productively open political ecology. Again, I'm still struggling with this, uh, uh, with this uh, intersections. Thirdly, I endeavor to further probe the link between an installative practice invested in sight and nature and the cycle of calamities that shape the life of the Philippine archipelago. How does a practice, how does a practice respond to this uh, uh, condition of uh, recurring crisis of nature. It is important that Juni characterizes installation as site work and the place where it happens as a halfway ground. I appreciate this vocabulary that imbricates field and labor within a, within a phase or a margin or a threshold in which the animate material, the critique of excess and the poet poetics of relation to reference Edward Lisson 
coalesce. In the procedure of Junius installation, the following aspects may be teased out uh, preliminarily. The site specificity, scenography and structure that morph into landscape and shelter, the participation of the audience in activating the locus of work, the reflection on the state of nature, the phenomenology of awareness, and the technology of making and building. This might be a good place to begin to think about the history of installation, which has become a retroactively clumsy nomination of particular post-sculptural forms in the Philippines and in Southeast Asia. But we use it, <clears throat> I suppose, deconstructively. Just before one of the longest quarantines in the world took effect <clears throat> in the Philippines, Juni proposed quarantine to the Vargas Museum at the University of the Philippines, a site of his earliest installation, uh, Balag. It is uh, a spare evocation of bamboo beds in what could well be any makeshift uh, abode. It is a timely and thoughtful response to a protracted emergency and a recurring crisis. Collaborating with the Pitopito Pito Art Group, he turns alone into a cell of isolation, but without the structures of confinement, thus intimating the melancholy of the time and the quotidian dread of both room and garden at a time when the campus was deserted. To this project of Juni, I would like to weave the work of Lani Maestro, who was with Juni in Los Banos for site works. Um, the work of Lani Maestro for Singapore Biennale 2009, 2019 sits sits a whatever circles from the center. It consists of a structure that holds over a hundred pieces of capis or window pane oyster shell standing at the entrance of the Singapore National Museum. The slightest breeze causes the shells to rustle slightly sway, and like vines, maybe the vines of Juni, entangle. Nearby are several white marble balls with letters that spell PSST or PST, which when sounded signal a beckoning. For Maestro, a dialogue arises at this moment of seeing, reading, and speculating, both presented between the spaces of museums and their formidable architecture. The pieces of Juni and Lani uh, project the fragility of the human passage in which an installation of this kind faintly but also irresistibly extends, extends respite from the maladies of the modern. Aside from site works where they work together, Juni and Maestro share common ground with Raimundo Albano the theories of the Philippine installation and the curator of the, cult at the Cultural Center of the Philippines, whose idea of developmental art at the center sought to interlace the developmentalist rhetoric of a developing nation state and the experimental explorations of contemporary art. And this is Ray's writing, Developmental Art of the Phil Philippines. And here is also Ray in the performance of Jose Maceda's cassettes 100 in 1971, which is also an um, intersection because the other node of connection between Juni, Albano, and Maestro is Jose Maceda, whose cassettes 100 was re-performed at the Cultural Center of the Philippines in 2017 with Maestro Lani participating also designing the shirts and Juni attaching palm stalks onto the cassette recorders of the participants and painting the top part with luminous red paint. Juni thought of them as uh, swirling antennae as the people moved around, the space, around in space, alluding to his wood things in the 80s in the same area, in the same cultural center. Perhaps it is at this intersection with Lani and Juni, that I return to the title of this presentation. The materiality of nature in the installations of Juni is not only medium and facture, it is also significance, urgency, and the life world or milieu of the elements and relations. And the site where the work emerges or transpires embodies the volition of the work, 
the object and the labor of art and the will of artists to work with or upon it. The site is not merely source, therefore, it is a condition of knowing and learning and making. Finally, in calling up an environment with art or through or beyond art, I wonder how an installative form mediates the expectation to articulate a social reality and its implications, while at the same time, keep the instinctive space politically open for a generative engagement with the intermittent tropics of nature. So thank you. Thank you so much, Patrick. Um, that's a really generative talk. There's um, a number of questions to, to deal with and I've got a, a, a number of questions of my own as well. Um, there's some thanks and also just acknowledgements coming through as well. But um, I might keep my question aside and I'll jump into Chaitanya's, who I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, because it, it does coincide with a, an issue that I was wondering about. Um, in your article, The Nature of History, I've also read you uh, writing about Obano's idea of developmentalism. Mm -hmm. And Chaitanya here asks, um, would you speak further about developmentalism or what Obama, I believe, called developmental art. Um, but here, Chaitanya is calling, uh, referring particularly to the you know, policies around developmentalism in relation both to Albano's discussion of Junius Wood things and to the various green revolution initiatives that the developing world experienced during the Cold War. Mm -hmm. In other words, he asks, is it possible to speak of Junius developmental sculptures following their quasi organic logic towards installations as resistance to or critique of developmentalist attitudes to controlling and improving the natural drought-proof rice, cattle immunities, infections, etc. What do you read of that? Yeah, that's an interesting question from Chaitanya. Well, it's from Chaitanya, so it should be generative. Uh, yeah, it, it, it might, it's, uh, this is also the reason why I included that a photograph of Imelda Marcos and uh, Lyndon Johnson inspecting Miracle Rise as a, a site of uh, another kind of developmental discourse, uh, uh, maybe complicating the Cold War with this uh, war for war against hunger no? uh, mm -hmm. at that time. The conception of um, uh, Albano of developmental art was a bit you know, elusive. And I think uh, Albano imbibed that uh, elusive disposition because he was working within the center uh, mm -hmm. with, with the government, but at the same time, he wanted to initiate changes from within. So he must have, and this is my reading of Albano, he must have uh, thought of an idiom that would respond no, to the rhetoric of the nation state, and at the same time, reference this uh, developing uh, attitudes of uh, what, what can be considered contemporary art. Maybe developing in the, in the sense that it is like a process, but also in the sense maybe of photography, that mm. it's, you know, you know, it's developing. Uh, and uh, we are, we bear witness to its uh, condition of, of making, not mm -hmm. the finished one, not the product, you know, but the condition of the making. So that's why he, he, he was drawn to Juni, I think. He was drawn to Juni because Juni would exemplify an aspect of that, you know, that it is not fully formed, that there is a performative aspect, that there is also a sense of uh, ephemerality and decay, yeah? But to the developmentalist rhetoric, well, it is a museum. So it is a controlled environment. It is an environment that controls this course of identity Mm -hmm. that to some extent uh, instrumentalizes expression as uh, what would be ciphers of uh, culture. No? So, so these are, well, this, that strain might feed into the other type of development uh, rhetoric. 
But again, as I said, uh, Albano did not work on binary sense. Mm. He was quick to move in between. So, so it's not so easy, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm always not quick to, to say that it's a critique. Huh? Because I'm, I'm trying to move away from the characterization of the critique. Because that might not be the language to uh, think through the strategy. It might be critical at some level, or there might have been some uh, disposition towards commentary, and it also showed uh, at certain levels. But I wouldn't say it was like contra or uh, anti. I mean, mm. I, 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 I try not to use these prefixes because they uh, uh, preempt other ways of understanding what Albano was trying to do with the discourse of the developmental. Yeah. But mm. yeah, having said that, it was Albano's idiom, not uh, Juni. I mean, I don't know what he thinks of the word developmental. Yeah, he just, you know, he did his thing. If, he, if Albano, the curator, would, you know, uh, would consider it developmental, then that no, must, I think um, I, that, yeah, yeah. I think it's also a situation that seems to be um, shared in a lot of, um, let's say, post-war, Cold War, uh, Asian contexts. And, and there I'm thinking about also the nation one of the things that you, you mentioned, you, talk, you were talking about the risk of the assimilation of the indigenous mm. to the national mm -hmm. as, as the natural. And I thought that's such a, an interesting comment mm. because that's still very much a, a risk. And it also raises the issue of what's considered indigenous, which of course, you know, in Australia, there's a very different currency in some ways. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Very different, yeah. And also the fact that CCP, the cultural center itself, was sitting on reclaimed land. So that in itself was developmental. Uh, it was a public works uh, achievement to reclaim land from the sea. So it mm. was like miracle rise too, right? I mean, you know, a, a, a brutalist building from the bay, mm. emerging from the bay, yeah. Um, I, I have another question um, and fr from the, the Q&A here, uh, which mm -hmm. I'll just read out for you. Um, how would you project or hope to see Juni's continued relevance as a pioneer of environment as aesthetic mm -hmm. form and advocate uh, an advocate of indigenous as global in this highly virtual environment? Um, so is mm -hmm. there a, a global sort of aspect to this, perhaps through our net networked experience that we that we're part of tonight as well. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, the, the relationship between the vernacular and the viral. Yeah, so um, I, I don't have a quick and smart answer to that. Uh, yeah, and uh, I also not sure if Juni has uh, thought through that possible connection between the you know, the natural and the digital. Well, the digital for a certain generation is the state of nature, no? Mm. Yeah. So I don't know how uh, the, how uh, someone like Juni would migrate no, to that uh, condition. Yeah. I, I it's think not yet. We don't see it yet. Yeah. I, I thought it was curious just on the notion of networks the the sort of circulation obviously around Fukuoka, EAPT, and these opportunities to, um, to to make certain kinds of work and to realize certain ideas. And I wonder, um, again, thinking about the developmental, if you've been thinking about this in relation to some of the actors that you've, you've discussed this evening, the sorts of opportunities, the resonance between different sides um, because there's also works for ASEAN, for example. And again, talking about your resistance to the idea of uh, a, a simple kind of critique or a sort of you know, classical avant-garde position, mm -hmm. this seems to be something, uh, 
again, resonant in that in those sorts of relationships, the sorts of opportunities that came out of sites like the, the cultural center that are difficult to, to reconcile in some ways today. Yeah, so that also Olivier becomes a part of uh, uh, maybe a methodology mm. at the um, and uh, 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 John Clark already alluded to this in his new book, the, the importance of the affinities of place. So the affinities of place uh, uh, produce this, this geopoetics, this geopoetics that might uh, help us move away from uh, geopolitical overdeterminations. Mm by colonialism, the Cold War, even I think globalization, globalization. So um, that's why I, I, I referred to uh, Glissant's Poetics of Relation uh, because they uh, address the aspects of placemaking, placemaking, mm. and also uh, the ecology of, of, uh, of uh, kinships. Yeah, and uh, they take root in in uh, in travel too, migration, uh, beginning. I mean, and that's why I also begin this presentation with the inter-island, inter-province. Uh, that was part of the formation of Juni. He moved around quite a lot uh, within Mindanao and the Visayas uh, to two big islands in, in the Philippines before finally settling down in, uh, in Manila. But even then he moved to Los Baños. So, I mean, so one can trace this movement as part of the, like the geopoetic, uh, geopoetic itinerary of, of a practice, yeah, which should uh, serve as a foil, not to merely uh, cast the you know, the work in terms of uh, like national identity or uh, geopolitical critique and so on and so forth. So uh, as I mentioned, it's a, it's, a, it's a methodology as well, aside from a description of the practice. In, 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 that, in that vein, uh, one of my questions was actually relating to methodology because I'm struck with the work trying to recuperate the work's presence, particularly for the issue of installation. Um, I, I was um, you know, thinking about the materials and the scent of those materials and the sort of, you know, the experience of those materials. And at one point you, you did mention with wood things, you know, the scent of that material. Um, and this, this is affective experience, I guess, challenges again, modernist expectations mm -hmm. of how these forms and how sculpture functions perhaps. But um, so I, you know, you also mentioned that this this idea of the domos to the demos, mm -hmm. that experience and sense of community, which again for me perhaps connects to a multi-sensory experience. So I wondered then, is that you know to put the question back to you, mm -hmm. and this is a question for us as art historians, um, you know, in que in questioning methodology, how do you historicize scent? How do you recuperate that type of multi-sensory experience? Is this project you know, leading you to a, you know, a, to form a different methodology? Is it challenging your... Mm -hmm. Yeah, it should, no? <laughs> and uh, uh, the, the art historical methodology, uh, however intellectually intense it is, uh, has not really provided uh, procedures for that, no? But I think if we do a close reading of the practice. Mm. And the practice itself activates the procedure, I think. And so I think it is here where we also can learn from Juni, you know, that you know, he's not, like, not a researcher discovering, but uh, learning from the mountain. Mm. So uh, we, we should learn from the art uh, through a close reading, which would offer us uh, uh, idioms or um, words, phrases. That's why I also uh, liberally use the titles of, uh, of uh, Juni as tropes. They become tropic, no? Uh, they're not just, uh, you know, nominations. Mm. Uh, 
and also in 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 reference to the decay that in a way produces the scent in the white cube i think the aporia also came in popoca mm. when they couldn't hang the work no? mm. they couldn't hang the work so they just placed it on the floor which was not the logic of the work no so uh, i think that moment no and even the documentation is quite uh, fuzzy no you barely see it <laughs> But uh, when I was looking for it, Juni said, that's, that's the one. Uh, mm. uh, lost in the crowd and then also turned into a, like a, some kind of a, a skirt or dress by, by Albano who did the poster. So it's quite an interesting uh, story how, how the form uh, that was preempted of its potential would find uh, would become an important um, a moment in rethinking methodology mm. not only curatorial methodology but also art historical methodology uh, albano wrote a long uh, an essay a substantial essay on uh, his critique of the Fukuoka event uh, that why is it i thought he thought it was a festival because it was a rugby rice as a festival. Mm. So he, he was uh, looking for that atmosphere. And he was uh, invested in the festival, mm -hmm. as, you can, as, you, as, you, as you can see in his uh, uh, citation of the, uh, of the folk festival as a, as a, you know, as a language of, as part of the language of installation. But when they went there, it was modernist, it was, you know, mm. You know, pedestal and wall, and so on and so forth. So I think uh, the work of Juni uh, created that like some a bit of an aporia. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. I'm I'm conscious of the time. Otherwise, I would ask you to to elaborate on on your, the relationship between your curatorial and and art historical practice. Um, but I think we've seen some of that tonight, particularly with the last slides and and the work quarantine. Um, it's, it's now, you know, unfortunately, time to wrap things up, but it's been such a pleasure to, to see this work, particularly at this stage in the, in the project. Um, I'd like to, on behalf of the series, uh, thank you again, Patrick, for taking the time. Of course, we would love to have you here in Sydney, and I hope that, that can happen in the future. Um, but um, thank you very much uh, once again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.